Welcome everyone to our webinar today. Glad you are with us. I'm very excited about this topic, business monitoring systems, applying machine learning to business metrics. Uh, my name is Wayne Eckerson. I run Eckerson Group, a research and consulting company based in Boston and focused exclusively on data and analytics. And I'm really honored today to have with us as a co-speaker and presenter, Sean Burns, who's CEO of Outlier.ai, a very, very interesting up and coming data analytics vendor. Sean, welcome to the show. And Wayne, thanks for having me. Uh, and everyone, thanks for being here. As I was telling Wayne before we jumped on, I did my graduate research in artificial intelligence 20 years ago, and we used to joke that we would never use the things we were learning in our lives. And 20 years later, it turns out they are useful. So it just all comes around in the end. Well, terrific. We, Sean and I are, are kind of co-presenting here. I'm going to take the lead and he's going to add color commentary. In fact, Sean, if we do a good job, they might hire us for the uh, Fox Sports season. <laughs> <laughs> That's a high bar. I'll do my best. Yeah, yeah. I've been following this new technology for a few years, and I think it's really just about to pop. So we wrote a report that you can now get at outlier.ai called Business Monitoring Systems. Well, it's the same, same title as this webinar. As some of you may know, uh, in 2005, I wrote a book on dashboards called Performance Dashboards, Measuring, Monitoring, and Managing Your System. It was very popular. It's the right book at the right time for the right audience. And I wrote a second edition in 2010. And I think it might be time to write a third edition because these business monitoring systems really in many ways are the next generation of dashboards. They won't replace them. They will definitely augment them. And I think they'll uh, become a, a permanent place in every organization's BI portfolio. So let's dive in here. As you can see here, a dashboard, I've always said, is a nice playground for most business users. If it's done right, it contains about 10 high-level metrics that can be uh, examined and filtered across 10 dimensions and maybe 10 hierarchies, uh, which gives you about a thousand metrics. So that's, that's big enough to answer most predefined questions, but not so big that users get lost in it. And as you know, dashboards uh, you know, usually get updated nightly or weekly. They have a certain amount of analysis built in, usually a trend line or so. Uh, and there are alerts, though we've tended to turn those off over the, the years because uh, they tend to have more noise than signal. Now, in contrast, uh, business monitoring systems give you a much bigger sandbox, millions of metrics, hunt, you know, all together. And we're going to analyze those metrics over any time interval, you know, the last second, the last hour, last day, last week, last month, last year. Uh, we can do a whole bunch of complex analysis, and the alerts are all automated through machine learning. This becomes a much more automated, autonomous system for monitoring your business, especially, especially operational me metrics. So I think you can kind of see here why I'm calling this a next generation dashboard of sorts. Sean, your thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting, Wayne. I, I became convinced that business monitoring was the future when I met a company who had, and I, I, I kid you not, four dozen dashboards. And their four dozen dashboards um, took about three hours every Monday for the executive team to look through them, trying to figure out what were they missing, what was hiding in all the data. And that I think we can all agree that's A, an extreme case, but it's, it's indicative that at some point dashboards break down because those million metrics that you mentioned that business monitoring is looking at they don't all live in one place. They live in all the different tools we use. I mean, compared to 10 years ago, we're using many more different systems, many more different tools, which are generating many more different kinds of data. And so I think that what you're seeing here is, is a step function change in the tools and the data we have, which require a new approach to it, which is exactly what um, business monitoring provides. And I think you made a good point. It doesn't replace your dashboard, right? You're not gonna count on a business monitoring solution to tell you what your revenue is today you're gonna look at it to tell you exactly what are you missing that's hiding behind that dashboard? Where are those emerging opportunities and emerging problems? 
Yeah, it may not replace dashboards, but I will say with a lot of the consulting clients that we've had recently, we're hearing a lot more that they spend a lot of time building dashboards, both the IT team and data analysts. And people look at them for a couple of weeks or months, and then they stop looking at them. <laughs> you know, because it's not telling them anything new. Mm -hmm. And why look at something where there's nothing actionable? So I think that's one of the liabilities of, of uh, traditional dashboards and business monitoring systems completely circumvent that. One of the reasons that traditional dashboards can't really examine all the things that are happening, bubbling up below the surface that you may not see in a dashboard is this thing we call combinatorial explosion. So once you start multiplying the measures times various dimensions, your business metrics really begin to explode. And we saw that on the last slide as well. So the benefit of a, a business monitoring system, as we've already hinted at, is that it's looking at all of your metrics. And as a result, it's going to surface things that don't make it up to that top level view or even the middle or bottom level view of your dashboard. So they'll surface those hidden patterns and really only the patterns that are relevant to your business that are going to have a direct impact on your business. So it's not going to surface everything it finds. It's going to be selective using machine learning and experience uh, to surface only what matters. So with that, you can proactively address issues before they escalate out of control. You can monitor all this quote unquote dark data that's, that's out there, you know is there, but you just don't have the resources to monitor it. Uh, it can reduce help desk staff because essentially it, it's finding things quickly and proactively so IT, IT group or others can address it. It's proving business models because now you're learning exactly how your business works or doesn't. And I think for me, the, the thing I find most exciting is that it frees up data analysts from instead of hunting for issues and problems or tracking them down and, and finding the cause once they arise, usually after the fact, now they can be a lot more proactive uh, and they can use their analytical tools for what they were designed for, which is to do real analysis. And the interesting thing about these business monitoring systems that I had to wrap my head around quite a bit at, initially was that you would think they'd be very complicated to set up and run. Uh, and in the old days they were, but these systems are extremely easy to set up and run. Maybe Sean can comment on that a bit. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and there's two reasons why they're easier to set up and run. One is if you think about how much effort we put into setting up a dashboard, all of the structures and the modeling and everything we do, it, there's two sides of that. One is it gives us exactly what we ask for. But the second is what we're baking into it is a lot of bias. A lot of the things that we think we know are important. But what if those aren't the things that are important? Or what if what's important is changing? And these new tools don't require a lot of setup, both to make it easy to use them, but also because if you were to have to spend a month setting them up, all you're doing is bringing your bias from your dashboard to these tools. So by not requiring a lot of setup, what they do is ensure they are gonna surprise you with unexpected changes, because that really is what their job is. Their job is not to, to show you the answers that you know you're already looking for. Your dashboards do that very well. Their job is to make sure that there aren't any blind spots and those blind spots by definition exist in surprising places. And so the ease of setup, I think is always surprising because in our industry, it's not always been the case, but it's also a feature. The ease of setup means that you are more likely to get these kind of unexpected insights across the board. We've, you know, I've seen a fortune five, a fortune 50 consumer brand set up um, a system in 15 minutes and be up and running and, and getting insights, which I know sounds insanely fast and hard to believe in our industry. But as we'll talk about later, it's possible because of how much machine learning can do for us that we used to have to do prescriptively ourselves. Yeah, so I like to say that these systems are like having 100 or more data analysts working 24 by seven, looking for issues that might affect core business outcomes, it's like having a data analyst in your pocket <laughs> more than That's one. Right. But, but it's cheaper, it's cheaper. It's not, not as expensive as 100 data analysts. That'd be a lot. Yeah, true, very true. All right, so we've talked about machine learning and, and without machine learning, this really wouldn't be possible. So what is the role of machine learning in these tools? Well, 
the first thing they do is actually learn the behavior of each and every metric that's being monitored. And it learns it over time, although that's measured in a matter of days, uh, not weeks or months usually. Uh, and it, be it begins to start to fit its model to actual behavior, including seasonality and shifts. Uh, the second thing it does is once it creates that baseline, it can detect significant deviations from it. And significant is a really important word. Uh, there may be an anomaly where something happens outside of the baseline, but the system through one way or another determines, you know, that wasn't, it didn't happen long enough or the, the, the degree of change wasn't significant enough to bother anybody about it. The third thing it does is personalize the alerts. It used to be in the old days, uh, back in the early 2000s, all the BI tools came out with alerting systems. And as soon as they released them, users turned them off. Uh, one, they took a lot of time to, to tune and users never could quite get it right. And eventually they started to ignore them. But machine learning actually personalizes the alerts to a very high degree. It looks at what you're looking at for one and what you find valuable and only surfaces things that you will find important. Number four, it correlates deviations with other changes. So it's not just looking at individual metrics, it's comparing metrics to each other. It's comparing clusters of metrics. And we have another slide on that later on. And finally, and something that, that's really interesting, we're just starting to see these tools begin to take the next step beyond uh, anomaly detection and correlation and actually start to suggest root causes. So Sean, what are, you, what are your thoughts about uh, the use of machine learning in these tools? Yeah, I think that you, you've hit it, and, and that graphic we, we see at the top is, is what traditionally is called anomaly detection, where you're doing time series modeling. And these tools can do much more than that, but it's, I think it's the easiest one to understand where you can really see how the system is learning fairly quickly. And again, the learning, as, as we mentioned, only takes days, uh, in some cases is immediate. So a system like Outlier has already learned from so many companies and so many customers that if you integrated your data today, it already has learned a lot of these things. And so your experience tomorrow would be pretty fantastic. Um, and it does, the great part though, is it's doing all this complexity, these dozens of forms of machine learning of which anomaly detection is one, without you having to understand them, without you having to know how they work. And so it's a very good force multiplier where if you are running your business, you can get the power of all these sophisticated algorithms, but because they're self-training and self-monitoring and self-optimizing, you don't have to spend a lot of time looking over their shoulder or configuring them or updating them. Their job is to make you better at running your business by doing all of this complicated mathematics for you and bringing it to you in, as, as Wayne said, a very simple form, which brings not just what happened, but why, what are the possible causes for why it happened and what else was going on at the time, enough context that you can pick it up and spend minutes instead of days trying to understand what's happening. Right, now we, I talk about significant, right? So these tools really try to understand what you find significant and the best of them present you uh, these alerts. So, but they're better than alerts though. They're like stories or narratives and they don't overwhelm you. They usually limit it to three or four, maybe five a day. You know, so they're, they're, you know, they're like having a librarian that's judiciously selecting books just for you. So this is an example of a story from Outlier, and you can see that it's telling a story not only visually, but using text that's generated by natural language generation tools. Um, and it has, I think it has links to other things, but at the bottom also, it's suggesting root causes uh, by surfacing mostly correlations to other things that are happening at the same time. So what does a daily insight do? It visualizes uh, the deviation or anomaly or correlation, uh, natural language explanation, potential root causes. And then something I didn't say is that it allows you to share these insights with others. Sean, you you created this one. Yeah, you know, this 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 story is right from your tool. Um, how else would you describe what these do and the impact on the business? 
Yeah, I think you captured it well. The, the, what we use when we were starting Outlier and building our product and designing these things and the standard we use is what will you expect from those 100 data analysts if they were looking through your data? Like what experience would you expect from them? You'd expect high fidelity, meaning they would bring you a, a handful of the most important things. But what they bring to you would be easy to understand and contain everything you needed to make a decision. And so the story you see on the left, while it's fully generated by our platform using machine learning, and there's dozens of forms of machine learning that go into generating even just this here, all that complexity is hidden so you can quickly read through it. And then it looks like it's written by a person and gives you the context that you need very quickly. So that's the usability bar I think that historically might've been missing from these kinds of approaches, which is you don't need a degree in statistics or analytics to get value of it all of that power of all the, the years of research in the platform get presented in a very intuitive way. And so what we find is that of companies adopting these tools like Outlier, most of the users, frankly, are not experts in analytics. They aren't experts in statistics. They don't know things like SQL, but because the experience that they get in these reports is so easy to understand and the fidelity is high, so they only have to look through you know, three, five, six of these a day, they can make a lot of use of them and they can start to become more data driven in a way that previous tools made it more difficult for them. So I think it's exciting to watch that kind of adoption as we have the platform do more of the hard work, but also provide a very intuitive and simple portal into the results. So you might be wondering, well, this is all fine and good, but you know, we can't just throw this at all of our metrics. Well, you can, but typically, <laughs> you want to start with a specific use case in mind. So these are some of the use cases that are more commonly um, used uh, and applied with uh, business monitoring systems. And you can see that a lot of them are largely operational in, in the form uh, where they have to sift through lots and lots of data and metrics to find deviations uh, and correlations and patterns. Uh, Sean, some of these uh, your customers are doing. Do you have any um, further words to say? Absolutely. So I, we find a lot of our customers, when they think about a tool like this, what are, what are the unexpected patterns that are actionable? What are the unexpected patterns that mean the most? And often that is a shift in your, your customer or consumer behavior. So let's say you're an e-commerce marketplace. You want to understand, okay, how do the purchasing habits of my customers change? And when I say customers, all of the possible hundreds of thousands of customer segments, how do men over the age of 35 in Oakland um, purchasing shorts, how does that change? How does the size of our order change? How does our response to promotions change over time? And so you can, with these tools, understand uh, your customer behavior in ways that traditionally were very difficult because of how hard it was to look through all those myriad things. And what you find is that customers can provide you with the fuel for your next set of strategies. They will tell you through certain customer segments beginning to buy in different ways, they can indicate bigger changes in the horizon and how customers are buying. And that same kind of early insight into change affects a lot of these cases. Fraud, for example, a lot of fraud use cases really are, again, subtle changes in consumer behavior because you know, if somebody steals my credit card, they're not gonna go out and, and use it tomorrow. They're gonna test it. Uh, and anybody who's perpetrating fraud often has a period of testing their, their attack vectors on your system. Those appear as subtle changes in consumer behavior, in customer behavior. And so it, this kind of tool, because it's able to sort through uh, all the dimensions of your data, look through all the segments, it unlocks a lot of use cases that historically had to be very reactionary. Like you had to wait until consumer purchasing behavior changed a lot before you really saw it reflected in your data. You had to wait for these fraud attacks to really trigger their big, uh, their big attacks before you could see them. But now with business monitoring tools, because they look at such a fine grained uh, aspect of your data, you get the early indications, you can get ahead of them. And we have case studies on our website about how these early indications of consumer behavior shifting or even fraud can be worth millions of dollars because you catch it a week, uh, weeks, months earlier than you might otherwise have. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, these systems catch small, subtle changes that we really just don't have the resources to go out and, and detect ourselves manually. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really important. Now, I mentioned that a lot of these use cases are operational and they require large volumes of data and metrics. 
Would you agree with that? And are there any use cases that you would not apply this technology to? I, I do think it's true that the, the technology works best for operational use cases where you have changes that are happening and you want to make decisions to get ahead of them. Um, as we said before, there's a lot of use cases where dashboards are the best solution. Um, there's also many cases where, for example, you don't want to use a tool like this to look at individual users. Like your, your tools, your CRM system is the best way to understand each user on their own. These tools are be best for watching for larger patterns of how different groups of customers behave or how different larger patterns are emerging. Um, but the good news is that it spans across many different systems. And so often the most valuable use cases come from combining, say, your customer support data with your customer purchasing data with your advertising marketing data. And those may live in three different systems. They may live in three different places. Uh, and these tools connect to that data and can provide these insights that really, once you start thinking across silos, across functions, the insights can be pretty profound because often those silos were hiding things that we thought were happening before. So you wouldn't use a tool like this to say, okay, you know, is Sean um, still a loyal customer of our service, right? But you would say, okay, people like Sean, are they beginning to buy things in a different way? And does that indicate a shift in how we should think about marketing to them? Okay, so we've talked a lot about what business monitoring systems are. So let me step back for a second and show where they fit in the marketplace. This quadrant chart shows the BI market along two quadrants. The first is push-pull, which means uh, either we're pushing information to users in the form of predefined reports and dashboards that answer questions we think they might have, or we're allowing users to pull information from those systems directly through self-service uh, to answer questions that they have. In both cases, those are systems push or pull that are answering known questions or questions that people know they have or know they will have. The two quadrants on the right are a different beast. They are answering unknown questions, questions that users at the moment don't really know that they have right now or should have or will have. And in the lower right, we have AI for BI, which now people are calling automated insights. This has just started to emerge. A lot of BI tools now support this. And this is a technology that when you issue a query or view a dashboard behind the scenes, the tool is running machine learning algorithms against that data set that was returned to see if it can find other correlations and patterns beneath the surface for that data set. And then if it does, it will surface those uh, in your sidebar or footnote or what have you on the dashboard or the query panel. And those are very valuable, but as you can tell, they're uh, obviously offering a very limited view into what's actually going on. Now, business monitoring systems, as you've gathered already, do kind of the same thing, but on a much broader scale. And instead of allowing users to select the data set through a query or a, a report, the business monitoring systems are going after all of your metrics or all of the data you choose to, uh, you, to, to feed it. So I do think uh, business monitoring will join the other three sectors uh, to provide a complete BI portfolio for organizations. It might take a, a number of years, but I think this only makes perfect sense. I'm sure you would agree with that, right, Sean? <laughs> I am, I do, but I am biased. Uh, and I, the only thing that I would add, Wayne, is I think the key thing about these is that um, business monitoring, yeah, it's not replacing existing things that you do. In fact, what we find in practice is that deploying a tool like, like Outlier Business Monitoring actually makes a lot of the other tools you're using in the other three quadrants more valuable. So let's say you've invested in a search system for your data. Uh, what questions are you typing in? What searches are you running? A business monitoring tool will bring you those questions proactively. And what you'll find is your team will be using those more actively. You'll have higher utilization and therefore a better return on investment. Same thing with reports and dashboards. You know, a lot of the reason that those dashboards go out of favor and become unused is that you're not quite sure what should I be looking at? Is this the right thing to look at? But if a business monitoring tool brings you a new set of questions on a constant basis, 
you're going to know what dashboards, what do I need to look at? What did I miss that I don't want to miss again? And therefore, what you find is that it's a very good uh, improvement, not just the ROI on those business monitoring tools, but all the tools in your portfolio, because now you're not waiting for something to happen to have a reason to use them. You have a new set of questions that every day will drive you back to those tools. And so it's, I think it's an exciting, positive, virtuous cycle that erupts when you do have questions brought to you proactively, but also great tools for answering them. Now, some of you might be saying to yourselves, oh, this monitoring of metrics is nothing new. And, and, and you would be right. Uh, we've had metric monitoring systems for a long time, but they've been very narrowly focused in the IT space. You know, we've had IT monitoring systems that will monitor CPU, memory, network, and storage. Uh, and send alerts to your IT administrators uh, if something is awry. Uh, more recently, we've had application monitoring tools that do the same thing for your core business applications, tracking errors, latency, contention configuration, both at the application layer and below, uh, so that users understand if and when something's about to go wrong in that system and correct it before it crashes. But as you can see, business monitoring systems uh, are at a completely different level. They are working at the business level and they're tracking common business metrics like revenues, costs, usage, pricing changes. Uh, those are all fair game for business monitoring systems and many, many more as, as you saw on the prior slide. So right now there's a handful of vendors in this space. Outlier is one of the leaders. And there's some, some BI players who are dipping their toes in this space as well. There's a whole time series database and time series analytics field out there. But that tends to be at the lower levels. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, I, and one question I got a lot was, why, what, you know, why was it the case that you couldn't just take IT monitoring tools and, and apply them to business data? Why, why is there a whole new generation of tools that's erupting specifically for business monitoring? And the answer is that, you know, farther down the stack in IT monitoring, the data is pretty consistent. So, for example, the temperature in my data center should never jump by five degrees in five minutes. It just shouldn't happen. If it does, it probably means something's on fire. But in business monitoring, business data is very noisy, right? Consumers are fickle. Your business might be lumpy. And business data, because it's so noisy, requires very different approaches. And a lot of the historical approaches to how we used to do monitoring in IT systems and application monitoring, they don't work in a business setting because of how noisy it is. You need, you know, the original formulations of things like anomaly detection just generate far too much noise in business monitoring. And so a new set of approaches were needed that were native to that noisiness of business data, but also that had a different user experience. I mean, I've used tools across the stack and you know, at the business level, your user is an executive or a business leader. It, they need, as you saw before, they need you to provide it in a very intuitive and simplified way. Whereas as you go far down the stack in IT monitoring, they want like the raw, highly technical output because that's what they work on. They, they, have, they have to respond in minutes to something that may take an entire site down. So it's a very different approach. Uh, this is definitely the, the ancestry of where we came from. And it's just interesting how many similarities, but also how many differences exist. Right, so we're in the early stages of business monitoring systems. The early tools in this market focused on anomaly detection, and now most of them have moved to also provide correlation and trending among metrics. And a very few, including Outlier, are starting to address root cause analysis, which is very exciting. Further on, we expect these systems to start to not only tell you what happened, what it's related to, why it might have happened, but how to fix it. <laughs> and certainly machine learning is capable of doing that, as well as the last stage here, which is prediction. So, you know, when will something happen? Instead of catching it as it happens, now we can use these systems to predict even when they will happen. Any thoughts, Sean? No, I think, I, I think you describe it well. The, the kind of transformation, the way I like to think about it is, it wasn't that long ago, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that we all used to have paper maps in our cars. And if we were going somewhere, we'd pull out the paper map and try to figure out where we were going and map a route. And we get lost and it was difficult, but it was the best we had. What you're seeing is a rapid transformation in business where we're going from those paper maps, which are the old tools we had, to the GPS units we use to navigate our cars today, where they do a lot of the work of 
looking at the route, looking at traffic, looking at construction, and trying to make sure we focus on what we always probably should have been focused on in the first place, which was driving those cars. And I think that's that's true today. And as these tools are growing up really quickly, you have a virtuous cycle of the cust- the early adopting customers are providing a lot of feedback. And these tools are improving so fast. I mean, Outlier itself, we add on average two to three new forms of analysis every quarter. And when I say new forms of analysis, new types of things it's looking at, new ways of looking at your business. And that kind of growth just means that the value of it keeps growing amazingly quickly. And so it's exciting. I think we are at the verge of a big transformation. So Sean, I think you just invented something. These systems are like GPS for your data. (laughs) There you go. There you go. Provide that automated direction for you. This all seems pretty simple and straightforward on the surface, but actually delivering one of these systems is not too easy. One thing that Sean mentioned is that on the business side, these metrics are very lumpy. (laughs) And it turns out that not all metrics are created equal. They're, they're, they're very different depending on what they are measuring. Uh, you can see some examples here of different types of metrics and the values that they generate on a, on a time series basis. The first thing that these tools need to do is create an algorithm to figure out what type of metric they are monitoring and then use that algorithm to select the right algorithm to actually monitor and analyze that metric. So an algorithm to select your algorithms. I found that a very interesting thing about these systems. That's actually pretty easy compared to the next thing, which is what Sean was just talking about, is how these systems use machine learning to analyze what they're actually seeing and capturing on a time series basis. So I'm going to let Sean kind of explain this slide a little bit more to talk about the range of analysis that's possible with these systems. And he's already hinted at it quite a bit, but I think it took a while for me to really figure out, wow, these things do a heck of a lot more than just send alerts when something exceeds a, a predefined threshold. Yeah, no, it, and I think that, that it, it becomes necessary because you think your business is complicated, right? All businesses are complicated. And just looking at metrics that may jump or drop in a certain way is never going to be enough. There's too many things that are happening. And being able to capture those is what I was talking about before about different types of analysis. So in the Allier platform, that story example you saw before, to generate it, there is typically a 12-step process using a dozen different forms of machine learning to go from the raw materials of your data into the insights that you saw with the natural language generation and everything else. But here, what we're showing you is kind of a, examples of the wide range of analysis these tools do for you automatically, but in parallel. And so on one side, you have individual metrics. What happens if your revenue in California among people like me drops in a way that you didn't expect or begins to trend up? Those can be important indicators, but you also have groups of metrics, right? Sometimes things can still be behaving the way that they might expect but the relationship between them is the important insight. What happens if your marketing campaigns are doing really well, but they're actually causing a larger than expected number of customer support requests. On their own, customer support requests might look normal. On their own, the marketing performance might be might make sense. But together, that relationship tells you a lot about are people getting the most out of that marketing campaign. And these types of systems, uh, unlike previous systems, you're not saying, okay, analyze this group or analyze these relationships or monitor those relationships. Their job is to look through all of the possible relationships across all of your data. And so instead of setting it up and needing to say, okay, I want this type of analysis, type of analysis, you're getting these things automatically from these platforms, just like in the larger patterns on the right, you talk about now even bigger things in the business, even beyond relationships. Let's think about composition. Maybe our revenue looks flat, but maybe under the surface, all the different components of revenue have shifted around. We're making more money in certain places, but less money in others. Certain customers are buying more, other customers are buying less. And again, on their own, those changes may not be of note, but in together as a larger picture, what we see is a big shift in what's making up our revenue overall. Ranging from these individual metrics all the way up to these larger patterns, these systems are running dozens of forms of analysis in parallel so that those insights that you get are summarizing the biggest, at the the highest level, what's changing in the business. One of the great challenges 
of previous generations of tools is, you know, if a system sends you 20 different notifications about the same thing, you have to try to figure out what is the bigger picture? How do I piece them together? What these business monitoring tools like Outlier are doing is they're putting the puzzle together for you. They're bringing you the pieces assembled. And maybe not every single piece is there, but they have enough of the pieces that you looking at it should know exactly where to go and what to do and how to complete that question and, and pursue it. And I think that's the exciting part. And this is why people can pick it up who don't have a lot of experiences. You set up a system like Outlier or any of these tools today, you're getting all these sorts of analysis tomorrow. You're not spending weeks and months in consulting and, and configuration and modeling, but you're getting so much power out of the box to all these forms of analysis happening for you that it really is unlocking. It's helping us go from what I was referred to previously as a scarcity mentality, where it was really hard to get value from data up to now um, what we always should have had, which is data becoming an asset. Data is an empowering force where these insights are brought to us and we do what humans do best, which is just making decisions and taking action. So now you're all convinced and ready to go out and buy a business monitoring system. <laughs> but I've been around long enough, you've probably been around long enough to know there's no silver bullet. So every new technology has its challenges. With business monitoring systems, there are some issues on the user side. You know, when you present a, a story, even with you know nicely written text generated uh, by AI and a nice chart with a root cause analysis at the bottom, will the users believe it? <laughs> do they believe the system's actually doing what it purports to do and that analysis is correct? So that's one issue. Uh, another issue is, does, does the story actually explain the analysis well enough so they can get it, which can obviously improve trust? There are also these perception issues. You know, we've been so trained that garbage in, garbage out. And, and while that is true, even for business monitoring systems, AI has a way of minimizing the impact of poor quality data if you have enough data overall um, to work with. Uh, as we said earlier, you would think these systems would be expensive and complicated to set up and take a lot of time, but they really are not. They're all automated. So hopefully we'll talk about that more in the Q&A. You know, on the vendor side, the big thing is, you know, can they really separate the signal from the noise? You know, there, as Sean said, and I love this term, this data is lumpy on the business side. Uh, how, do, how do you monitor lumpy data and make sure that one lump is something that's significant to the users and not just a plain old lump? So that, that's probably the, the primary challenge. Uh, also, there are these things called event storms. So there could be one event that triggers uh, dozens or hundreds or even thousands of anomalies. The system has to be smart enough to be able to correlate those things in real time and consolidate them. So they're only presenting one thing to you and hopefully that thing is as close to the root cause as possible. And then finally, security uh, is, is always an issue because you're rooting through all of a company's data potentially with these systems. Uh, and you don't want to show them uh, stories or insights or information that they're not really authorized to see. So doing that at the scale and in, in real time using an aut automated autonomous system is also a challenge. And I'm sure Sean can attest to some of those things. Oh, I, and it's amazing how these things are interrelated. So for example, the reason these systems have to be zero effort to set up is because of that trust issue. You have to be able to see it for yourself. You're not gonna trust a demo. You need to be able to set it up in a few minutes and see for yourself that it does what it says. They have to be able to handle data quality issues because frankly, if a lot of companies have data quality challenges, if you expect perfect data, you're probably never gonna, never gonna get there. It's just an impossible task. And so these systems have to deal with the fact that expectations are high, that the challenge is high. And like you said on the, on the explainability front, they have to prove to you and show you their work. They, they can't just be a black box that is doing these things. So every outlier story, you, know, you can click through and see every, the entire hierarchy of, of how it came to this conclusion and why did it bring this to your attention. And I think that's a good thing. I think that we have a new generation of business tools which are being held to a higher standard. And that higher standard, it means that these products are being designed to do what we should expect of them, which is 
be super fast to set up so we can try them before we buy them. They should be able to handle data quality and data scarcity, that data spread out. And they should be able to explain what they're doing. These, they're, these are things you should expect. And so I think that these demands and these issues are a good thing because they mean the products that we're seeing are better. So the last slide really is how do you get started? Uh, obviously this system type of system has a lot of value. And it will certainly play a huge role in your BI analytics portfolio. Sean and I talked about this a bit. He's got more experience than I do implementing these systems. But it makes sense to start and test it. So test it with a small use case, something that's pretty doable, that you can just see how they work and get a feel for them. And experience the kind of insights that they deliver. Give it a few days to, to burn in, so to speak and learn your metrics. You don't go overboard, but just get a feel for how it works. Then maybe alongside of that, start to identify and prioritize operational issues. You know, things that have gone wrong in the past uh, that have affected real tangible business outcomes along the line of some of the use cases we mentioned, but there's dozens and dozens more. So you wanna prioritize those operational pain points uh, certainly evaluate the data that you can uh, deliver to these systems. Uh, obviously, the better the data and, and more data, uh, the better off you're going to be. And then finally, select a use case and monitor results. I think from all things that I've seen and read and talked to folks about, this can be a powerful new addition to your analytics portfolio. Sean, you have more experience working with customers in the field, but is there anything you would add here? Yeah, I think the key thing is, you know, unlike previous generations, since you can just connect your data and you don't have to worry about defining rules or setting up the ML algorithms or tuning them yourself, it really is a set it up with your data and let it, let it run. The best thing to do is to get started with whatever the easiest application is, whatever the easiest data and easiest use cases, because what happens is when users see that this is a different approach, it's a very different kind of experience, it begins to unlock a lot of new potential that previously we had decided was too difficult to pursue. And so it is very common, for example, with Outlier that they spend, you know, 10 to 15 minutes setting it up, they start to get insights and all of a sudden that light bulb goes off, like, actually, this does work. This is amazing maybe I can finally tackle these other things that I've always wanted to do, but can never really get to it. So the easiest and fastest way to get started is the best because what we find is that then it unlocks a whole different set of use cases that may not have been apparent at the beginning uh, because frankly, it's always been too difficult to pursue them in the past. Okay, so that brings us to our Q&A session. I'm gonna start looking at the, the questions. We have a few here in the, in the box. While I'm looking at those, Sean, maybe you could address the whole architectural setup. I mean, I, I had a hard time believing that all you do is really connect to your data source. <laughs> well, I, like I said, I think people and you know, our audience tends to be a little bit more technical. They want to mm -hmm. know, well, how the hell does this really work? <laughs> That's a fair point. And so, you know, a system like Outlier, for example, is available in a, a number of different deployment methods, either there's a cloud version. You can also run it um, in your own environment if you need to. And what it's going to do is you're going to connect it to your data. Um, you're not going to have to do data modeling or configuration, but you know, let's say you have some SQL databases. You tell it how to connect. Uh, if you have some cloud services you use, like the Adobe Cloud or the Salesforce Cloud, you'd connect the APIs using OAuth or other authentication. And that process is very fast and that really is the extent of the configuration. You're not going to have to do much more because once you do that, Outlier's job is to look through all the data in those places. And one of the key differences from traditional tools is you're not, it's not making a copy of all your data. It's not going in and sucking all your contacts out of Salesforce or going making a photocopy of your database. It's going into the databases and those cloud tools and looking through the data, but extracting these, you know, millions and millions of metrics, all the different high dimensional metrics. And that's what all of the machine learning and, and statistical analysis is done on. So the good news is your, your PII, your consumer data never leaves the system it's in. They never have to go to other places. And the benefit is that Outlier shows you these kind of deep insights across many different data sources that may not have semantics involved. They may not have, you may not be able to map everything into the same 
data schema in the same data lake. And you aren't having to spend a lot of time setting it up because it's all online learning systems. There's no configuration or tuning of the machine learning. The only tuning that happens is the usage of it. You know, Outlier watches you use the platform. It learns from you. It learns from your team and what you find interesting. But there's also aggregate learning across all customers. And so that's why, you know, just like Netflix watches you watch movies and the more movies you watch, the better the recommendations get. But it's also the case, the more everyone watches movies, the better the recommendations get for everyone. The same is true of these kinds of systems is that, you know, Outlier have been around for five years. The system is very intelligent. If you were to set it up tomorrow, you'd get a great experience the day after that because you benefit from the wisdom of the crowds that have come before you. So it's a very interesting new kind of experience. And I do realize that after years of, of having a lot of difficulty deploying solutions, it can seem too good to be true, but a lot of it comes down to not magic, um, but just a very unique and orthogonal and refreshing approach to the problem, which is, again, like as I said at the beginning, we need these tools to survey the data and bring us the signal. And traditionally, the signal we got by defining better rules or configuring metrics in more detail. And now with machine learning and running that at scale, we can rely on these systems to do the hard work for us to find that signal in the noise, to find the needles in the haystack. And these systems are complicated, but since they hide that complexity behind the user experience, it's very empowering. And that's why I'm so excited about it. Yeah, as I am too. But just to be clear, well, for our audience, I have to say I've looked at a number of these tools and they, they all work a little differently. Um, they all try and get to the same endpoint, but architecturally they're, they're a little different in how they work. Uh, so Sean, with, with Outlier, you are querying whatever source systems that people want to feed data to your system. You mm -hmm. said you don't suck data in, but you do, you do query the source systems and you pull out aggregate time series data, which you then pull into Outlier, right? That's right. So we don't have, you know, we wouldn't store Sean's email address and Sean's credit card number, all those things that live in these systems. But we would look at, okay, what are our sales of shorts to, you know, men over the age of 35 living in Oakland, all those sorts of different things. And so it means that the systems aren't extracting the personal identifiable information, but it is extracting the enormously high resolution, high dimensional business metrics. And are you kind of chunking that aggregate time series data up by specific time intervals or not? Uh, yeah, and it, I think the way to think about it is these systems look at all the data through every conceivable permutation and lens. So it looks at every conceivable time interval, every conceivable segmentation, all those different things. So time but is it, just another dimension because some tools, you know, they'll give you five different time intervals that it looks at but yours can do any interval that you want. Uh, well, so in practice, you know, let's be honest, in the, and this goes back to the difference between a business system and an IT system. I mean, business users think about the world in terms of years, quarters, months, weeks, days, and hours, really. Yeah. Um, and so that ends up being in practice what, what a system like Outlier looks at the world in terms of, but it, it looks at all of them simultaneously at the same time. Because for example, the weekly view of your business may tell a lot about seasonality. Whereas the daily view will find a lot of weekly cyclicality and the hourly view may tell you a lot about the time of day people tend to buy from you. And if you put them all together, you can understand the seasonality and cyclicality of buying patterns on Fridays at 8 p.m. in the fall. And so a lot of the key thing about these tools and using machine learning is while the output may look like a human analyst created it, it is doing things in ways that humans can't do. It's doing enormously high dimensional composite analysis that then it pulls together many different signals simultaneously that is different than a human analyst that would essentially build things up slowly block by block. These systems, because they can do so many things in parallel, can find these insights um, and that's what makes them so efficient. It's also why they can run so quickly that they can provide you such a constant stream of analysis is that the approach is very different from how a human would look at the world but easily explainable and also easily understood. Your system is autonomous and automated, but it's it's not, I mean, it's basically you re refreshing your data, usually nightly, right? Is that? Yeah, it's up to the customer. Most customers want it updated every day. Um, we have some customers whose data is weekly. They only have weekly data on their business and others have hourly data. So it's a range, but I would say on average, 
most companies prefer daily analysis. Yeah, so, some of the other tools in this space are emphasizing continuous. Mm -hmm. um, and they're closer to those IT and application monitoring tools than an outlier, I would say. Yeah, I think that's true. I think there are a lot of use cases where second by second analysis works well. The typical users of outlier are going to be executives, um, business line leaders, people whom aren't making decisions every second, but probably are making decisions every day. Okay, here's a question from Alex. How dependent, it's kind of a data quality question, how dependent is this approach on coherent data sets? I get the point about the main use cases being operational. However, often metrics monitored by executives are derived by sourcing data from multiple systems, merging and aggregating. Mm -hmm. So it's the sweet spot operational analytics, which tends to be a single source system analysis. What we found is most of the time, the, I can tell you the average customer of Outlier, the users are executives and the data sources are anywhere from a half dozen to dozens of different systems. So let's say you're a CMO, Outlier is probably looking at your advertising data, your web analytics data, your, um, your, your user activity data on your website, your purchasing data, revenue data, potentially your customer support data. That data probably lives in a lot of different places. So you connect outlier to each of those systems independently. There probably isn't a single source of truth. And I think the answer is the insights are doing a lot of that um, merging and aggregating for you. And it doesn't necessarily do the merging and aggregating the same way that your analyst team would do that. But it's doing it in a way that reveals these kinds of patterns and these emerging changes that are happening. And so we find that the most, I think if you had a single data source could these tools help? Probably, but the value goes up exponentially as you have more and more different data sources you connect them into. And so that's why we find that, you know, customers of Outlier connect to so many different sources because you get so much more out of the insights when it looks so much more broadly at the data. And I know that there's, you know, it, it can be having not used these tools before concerning that, well, if I connect Outlier to all these different systems, I'll just get all of this noise that will make my life more difficult and, uh, that isn't in, in practice how it works, but I can understand where that comes from. But that's also why it's so easy to try them out is so that you can see for yourself that these products don't generate a huge amount of, of false positives, a huge amount of noise that they are designed to find these kinds of insights. They do obviously ask you to think about the business in different ways because by definition, they are bringing you things you didn't expect. So a lot of those operational metrics were things that you looked at and you knew what you would do if they went up or down. These insights may not fit that worldview very well. I'll give you a basic example. Some of the customers, these are case studies on our website, right before in early March, late April, when, um, you know, before a lot of states went into shelter in place around uh, the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of our customers saw the early indications that was coming in their data. And it wasn't part of their operational playbook, but once you connected the dots across a bunch of things happening, there was a clear and obvious indication that something was coming and the companies that acted on it obviously had an advantage of being prepared. It is very interesting, but it's definitely not operational analytics. It is very much around making larger business decisions because there is not a customer using outlier where the executive team is not one of the primary users themselves. So geared to executives, Focusing on operational use cases, but pulling data from multiple sources, correlating, mm -hmm. correlating patterns uh, across those sources in complex ways to, to deliver new insights about the business in, in real time or near real time. Uh, so the business can be more proactive. Well, <laughs> you know, that's like string together all the buzzwords in our analytics. <laughs> oh, no, so, we could fit in. We could fit in some more. I'm sure there's a... Yeah. <laughs> automated, self-learning. You know, yeah. I think the struggle that you got, you and others are going to have with this is that it is the too good to be true syndrome. And I, <laughs> oh, I, I, I hear you 100%. And, and, and just one quick clarification. When I say executives, really decision makers. Not everybody has to be the CMO. You could be the, the lead digital marketing leader, whoever it might be. But I think you're right. And, and going back to what I said before, that's why these tools have to be so easy to try is that there's been too much, frankly, failed promises. There's been too many products that promised they would do things and didn't do them. 
And as a result, the bar is high. And so you have to be able to turn up a tool like Outlier quickly and see for yourself. It's, it, it's what you demand of it and it's what you should demand of it, that it should show you that it's working um, because you shouldn't trust it, frankly. I think that these tools are too complicated to see a demo and trust blindly that it will do what it says it does will do for you. You should see it working for you and it shouldn't take a lot of effort for you to see that. Great. Well, we've uh, just about run out of time. Um, just a little bit about Eckerson Group. As I mentioned, we're a research consulting and education firm focused on analytics. A lot of us know, uh, a lot of people know us for our research, but we also consult with very large organizations around the world to help them do more with their data. So with that, Sean, thank you so much. This was a really enlightening discussion appreciated your contributions to helping me understand this space. And I want to thank our audience for patiently listening. I hope you got a lot of value out of it and please spread the word. So thank you. And Sean, have a great day. Thanks for having me, Wayne. This was great. Thank you.